Rangers. So uh, we begin the afternoon with uh, David Jazzwise talking about topological quantum gates in homotopy typing. Take it away. Thank you very much. Um, it's been wonderful uh, being here this whole week with all of you and getting out to have lots of interesting discussions and hear everything that's fun that's been going on in applied category theory. So this, is, uh, this talk is going to be less compositional. In fact, one of the sort of things I want to do here is uh, ask a question to the applied category community, which is how would you make this kind of approach compositional? For now, this is a, a different sort of abstract approach to, uh, or abstract concrete approach <laughs> to uh, topological quantum computing. So this is uh, part of joint work with uh, Hisham Sati and Urs Schreiber. Um, uh, Erz and Hisham have this really grand program to understand uh, uh, to a lot of foundational physics um, using twisted equivariant differential uh, co uh, cohomotopy theory and K theory and other kinds of cohomology theories. Um, and it, it was their work in string theory that led them to understand anions in a new way um, that formed the basis of, of this kind of work. So uh, what's really cool is I get to step in at this point after they've tremendously simplified a lot of this really hardcore physics and talk about things in a lot simpler way. So that's what I'm gonna, gonna do here. So the order, the talk is structured in this order. So we're gonna see, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna go up the numbers here. And so I really could have called the talk Gates Quantum Topological Type Theory Homotopy in, which is the order that we're going to cover the material here. So uh, let me just uh, start us off so we're on the same page here. We have uh, computing, basically classical computing, we, our simplest unit is a two-state system, a two-state classical system called a bit. And we call those states usually zero and one. And then um, a logic gate, for me all logic gates will be reversible just because the quantum world everything is reversible is uh, uh, interpreted as a uh, automorphism of a power of the set of states of bits. So for example, here's C naught, the controlled not gate, and it takes two bits and yields two bits, and it does what is written over there. Um, so if it, it, the, the top one is sort of the control, and if the control is on, then it turns as, it acts as a not gate, and if it's off, it acts as the identity. And so this is sort of our, our uh, abstract model of classical computing. And in quantum computing, it's uh, almost the same, except instead of using sets, we use uh, Hilbert spaces or complex vector spaces with an inner product. And so uh, now we have a qubit, and a qubit is a two-state quantum system. So it is a two uh, 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 Hilbert space with a basis consisting of two elements, zero and one. Um, and the quantum gate is going to be the analog of a logic gate, a reversible logic gate. It's going to be an automorphism of some tensor power of uh, qubits. So this is a, uh, a unitary automorphism, I should say. Um, and this is a, a notion here. So C naught, I've written up in here using the ZX calculus that we saw uh, briefly yesterday um, and maybe in some other talks as well. Uh, uh, which is um, uh, expressing the same kind of gate here. You see now it, it represents a matrix, and that matrix would take um, our, our linear combinations of our, of our basis elements, which are the states of our quantum system, and transforms them. And you see, if we're in the basis elements, this matrix does exactly the same thing as on the left-hand side, but now we can have superposition, so we can do like quantum stuff. Um, so, that is one way of understanding what we're doing. That is sort of the denotational semantics. That's what we're trying to describe when we do these computing things. So we have our diagrams up here. Maybe we have diagrams at different levels. And we interpret them into these functions, right, in a monoidal category is often how we do it in applied category theory. And that's what we're trying to do with them, right? But that is still like a long ways off from actually implementing these things. So presumably when we want to build a computer, we want to turn our, uh, our, our logic description into something that we could actually build as a physical chip. And then that the behavior, the physical behavior of that chip would mimic the logical behavior of our desired uh, algorithm, right? And so uh, we, we usually have intermediate stages of representation, which we turn things into as we go along in this implementation. So in classical computing, one, one intermediate stage would be uh, representing these things as electrical systems. And these are still representations. It's not actually like, the, I'm not talking about the physical circuit. I'm talking about the mathematical model of the circuit, right? And similarly, in quantum mechanics, 
Um, instead of uh, interpreting into these, uh, you know, finite dimensional Hilbert spaces that is uh, sort of the, a lot of uh, applied category theory works in, we would go into something that's a little more infinite dimensional, a little more like traditional quantum mechanics. And that would represent the sort of our, a closer model of the physical situation that is going to be, uh, that, we, that we're modeling on our actual chipset. And finally, we hope that uh, as we can get closer with these representations, we can also uh, help people design these actual building things. So the one on the right there is an actual quantum computer in, uh, in Abu Dhabi. So uh, one uh, fun thing I want to note here, just I can't help myself, but the chips and the com quantum computer, they look like wiring diagrams themselves, right? There's this like great, um, I don't know, li like literal figurativeness to the kinds of math we do, which I think is really wonderful. So here's a little review of what quantum mechanics is for, for me. I'm not really a quantum mechanist. Um, so uh, it, we have a Hilbert space of states. That's a, that's a complex vector space with an inner product. Um, and uh, uh, that we interpret the norm of a state, uh, uh, the norm of a vector, uh, as uh, uh, its, its amplitude, as, as the probability that it can occur effectively. Um, and then we have this Hamiltonian operator, which encodes our physics. It's sort of an operator that measures the energy sometimes. Um, but it's basically the input to the system. The, the person who's modeling the system picks the, Hamilton, picks the Hilbert space and then the Hamiltonian. And then we get this equation, the famous Schrodinger's equation. It's not usually written like this. I've actually moved the terms to the, uh, the right-hand side, so it just looks like this. It's a linear differential equation, right? And then we can solve that to get a one-parameter family of operators on our Hilbert space, which, because this is a linear differential equation, is solved very simply as this exponential operator. And uh, that is the behavior of the system flowing in T there. And we say that one of these systems, uh, this is not like, well, this is formal, but we say that one of these systems implements a quantum gate if we actually get the behavior of the gate we intended by doing, by flowing along this Hamiltonian using this, this thing. So that's the basic setup. But one thing you should be wondering is what is T here, right? Uh, where is T? It was not up there, right? Uh, uh, I do category theory and type theory, and I like all my variables to be declared with their proper type. And T was not declared. So where does T live? So really what we have is T is a real parameter. So it lives on the real line. And so really what we have is not a single Hilbert space, but rather a bundle of Hilbert spaces over this parameter T. So we have our Hilbert space H0 at time zero, then we have our Hilbert space HT at time T, and our dynamics as we flow in time is gonna take us from states at time zero to states at time T. T is an external classical parameter in quantum mechanics. So you've probably heard the problem with quantum gravity is that, but this is not about that, but this is just to say it's really an external parameter. It's something that's outside of the Hilbert space. Um, now, any bundle over the line is trivializable. So the data here is effectively the same as what we had on the previous page. We just picked a Hilbert space and we put it over the real line. But we have more because we also had the Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian is an operator on this Hilbert space. So I can put it, package it into the information of a one form which is the same as a connection on this bundle. So a connection on my Hilbert bundle is the same thing as my Hamiltonian. And then, even going further, what can I do with a connection? Well, I can parallel transport. So I can take a path in my parameter space. Here, I just take my time interval. And then I solve the differential equation that tells me what parallel transport is. It turns out to be Schrodinger's equation. And I get the dynamics of my system as parallel transport. So this is a, this is a view on quantum mechanics from this point of view. This is ordinary quantum mechanics, but we're bundled it up because Time is not the only classical parameter that we might have to deal with. So in general, a quantum system is going to be modeled by a bundle of Hilbert spaces over some parameter manifold, some smooth manifold of parameters, our parameter space. And the information of the Hamiltonian will be encoded in a connection on this bundle. And parallel transport in this connection gives us the dynamics of our system. So the idea here is that when you actually build an actual quantum system in an actual laboratory, you have a bunch of science knobs, which you have over there that determine where you are in parameter space. And as you turn the science knobs, the condition that that system is in change, and the state of it updates as accordingly, and that's this parallel transport. Um, right. So uh, yeah, 
So one of the issues with this, um, well, this is a sort of issue, maybe I want to say right before I go on here. One problem we tend to have in quantum mechanics is that, uh, in quantum computing, is that it's really hard to have lots of qubits. And it's hard to see why it would be hard to have lots of qubits if you just take like your single Hamiltonian, uh, sing, your single Hilbert space. But if you have this point of view, right, you start to see that like taking, keeping track of all the qubits tends to proliferate your classical parameters because you have this big machine with lots of little parts, all of which are sort of at the classical level. They're set by different classical features which then you end up with this large parameter space. And sort of a curse of dimensionality means that when you try to turn your science knobs, you introduce lots of noise into the system. And in a general connection, in a general connection, the parallel transport depends on the path. And so even if you take a slightly different path through parameter space, you might end up with an arbitrarily different um, uh, parallel transport. And this is the susceptibility of these quantum systems to noise. And uh, uh, so one, um, one, one th problem this, uh, this, this means it's very hard to scale these systems to many qubits. Um, however, there's a sort of obvious solution once you frame the problem this way, which is that if the connection were flat, right, then parallel transport does not depend on the path specifically. It only depends on the homotopy type of the path. The parallel transport is homotopy invariant. So there, as you see, if I, I'll zoom in here. In, in here, I have my noisy path, which is my intended paths in, in, in pink. My noisy path is in orange. And I have this homotopy between them, which is I could continuously deform the noisy path back into the, the intended path. And as long as the noise is small enough, it won't go around any holes in my parameter space, like that donut hole over there, right? And for that reason, like if I, you know, if it's really noisy, who knows what happens if you knock over the computer, right? But if it's just a little bit of noise, it's probably in the same homotopy class, and so we get exactly the same behavior uh, of the of the dynamics. And so these systems are called um, topologically insulated systems. And effectively, again, this is a uh, this is sort of a very uh, um, it's not not a totally realistic uh, or one to one thing. It's just sort of for the purpose of this talk, understanding what it is. A topological system is one of these Hilbert bundles with the connection where the connection is flat, and these are called topologically insulated. One thing I want to say is for mathematicians is when physicists say topological, a mathematician would say homotopical. So all the topological features of blah 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 are really homotopy invariant features. So that the correct, uh, everything physicists do are topological for mathematicians because they have lots of geometry and numbers and all this stuff that has topology. When they say topological, they mean homotopy. Um, so since parallel transport is a homotopy, is homotopy invariant, it only depends on the homotopy class of our maps, it actually gives us a representation of the fundamental group of our, our uh, parameter space on these Hilbert spaces of the fibers, right? And so I've written it down here. Here, B pi 1 P is a groupoid. It's a groupoid. You could think of it as a groupoid with a single object, or you could think of it as a groupoid with an object for every point of P, but it doesn't really matter. And the morphisms in it are homotopy classes of paths. So it ends up being a groupoid. That's the fundamental groupoid. Um, and when you map it into uh, Hilb, the, the groupoid of Hilbert spaces, you end up with, as functorially, this is what the parallel transport is. So one of the cool things is that if you have a topologically insulated system, all of a sudden, all this analysis disappears and you're left with pure representation theory, which is fun, it's algebra. So let me try and narrow this down. I wanna narrow down on how could we end up with a topologically insulated system, and we're gonna model a specific uh, class, a very narrow class of these systems that are considered to be realistic proposals. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna braid defects in topological quantum materials. So uh, I don't think anyone's currently made a topological quantum material in the lab yet, but this is the idea is that it's gonna be some roughly two-dimensional lattice. So this is a lattice formed by just putting plastic balls in a case, but it illustrates something important, which is that the lattices can have defects. And here in red are the defects. 
Uh, some of the, the defects can be formed when the local symmetry is not the same as the expected symmetry in a generic point in the lattice. So if you're down here, it, the symmetries are like these star symmetries here, the plane symmetry groups determined by there. But when you're around one of those defects, it looks different, right? So um, um, there's also line defects that can occur, by the way. This is a slippage defect. Um, and we're going to not, we're going to ignore those. So we're going to assume that there are no line defects. We're just going to do point defects. So um, one thing to note about these is if you squidge, if you squidge these defects, if you squidge this lattice, the defects will move. You imagine like pushing some force on it, then you can, they will close up, but maybe, you know, now it will cause it to pop up somewhere else. So the defects actually can move around like, uh, like particles. They're, they're quasi particles. All right, so we, yeah, we can move by squidging. And then we also imagine that there's some field on here that has some particle existations, and those are called anion, anionic particle existations. I'm not gonna explain why they're called anions. Um, and they, they're moving around on the lattice. So this is sort of the setting that we expect to be in. So there's a, a, a mathematical proposal for the, for the sort of mathematics which governs this kind of lattice, which is there, there is, uh, it, it's supposed to, these anionic particles are supposed to follow this conformal theor field theory, and the Hilbert space we get are called the conformal blocks of this, co the conformal field theory. There's a lot of asterisks and an enormous number of asterisks in there. And it carries a, a connection that is defined on it, which is supposed to give us the dynamics of this a system called the Konizhnik-Zomologikov connection. And this is a bundle over our parameter space, and our parameter space is the locations of the defects on our lattice. And we model this as points in a plane. So our parameter space is the configuration uh, space of D points in the plane R2. And so we have some defects in the plane and depending on where they are, that determines what kinds of states we can have, and those states are the states of the anions. And uh, uh, one thing I want to note is what is a path and configuration space? A configuration, by the way, is just a way of putting points in the plane, so it's like this is a single point in the configuration space over there. This is another one. A path is a way of moving those points continuously, but they have to remain distinct. So it ends up braiding their histories along. So if you've heard of topological quantum computing is about braiding, this is what it means. You're, you're, you're moving defects along, they braid the histories. Two paths like this are going to be homo, uh, homotopy inequivalent if they describe different braids. So that's the sense in which just keeping the points in the same place versus moving them around each other are going to give us different operations. Okay. So thanks to the hypergeometric integral construction, which is a uh, very uh, kind of difficult result in fun uh, functional analysis that uh, has, a, has a fairly long history, but the reference I want to point you there to is uh, uh, Hisham and Urz's paper, Anionic Defects in uh, Topological, equi uh, sorry, Twisted Equivariant Differential K Theory, where they uh, give a really abstract formal characterization of this. And the end result of this is that there's an equivalence of these bundles from the conformal box with their condition exomologic of connection into this other thing, which may look more complicated, but I promise you is only is much simpler because I wrote the full definition there instead of not writing anything on the left-hand side, which is the, the Gauss-Menin connection on a bundle of twisted cohomology groups of configuration spaces of the anion. So remember, we have these anionic particles floating around the defects. Let's say there are n of them. Then they can't go into the defects. They have to go around. So they form the configuration space there at conf n r2 minus c, where c is our configuration in the base. And then we take these cohomology groups, or complex cohomology, and they turn up to pick up this complex linear structure. And that's where we get our like complex numbers from. So that's our, our setting. By virtue of being able to do that, we can turn something which is an analysis, geometry, and conformal theory, theory, which is all really hard, into something which is in pure homotopy theory, and also homological algebra and representation theory, which is still really hard, but it is discrete. So <laughs> it, it is, and it's algebraic. So because it's in pure homotopy theory, and now we have this equivalence, so this, this thing is in pure homotopy theory, we can give a completely abstract formal verification language for this situation using a programming language that uh, interprets faithfully abstract pure homotopy theory. That's known as homotopy type theory. And so, uh, and one cool thing is that if we write this in a homotopy theory that is a programming language, we can run it. 
we can actually get classical simulations of these things just by describing the definition. And um, I wrote that in gray because uh, it's sort of an ongoing project to make these things performant. Um, there's a lot of work being done on it, and it's really exciting work. So I think that's like one of the big, big things is once we get this done, the next thing is to try and really make these evaluation uh, strategies work to, so it, it goes on. So now I'm gonna, in my last five minutes, I'm gonna try and introduce homotopy type theory, and then I'm gonna have one slide which tells you what we did. So that's just how, it, how it's gonna work out. So homotopy type theory is a logical system for working directly with homotopy types. Homotopy types are spaces, but only considered up to homotopy. Okay. So another way to think of it is it's a standalone foundation of math, and it's better to think of it this way because you'll get less confused. So we have these types of mathematical objects. These types can have elements. It, these types can have variable elements, and we write them uh, down there, like x squared plus one is a variable real number, given that x is a real number. And we write every expression in type theory with a context, and that context is a list of all our free variables and the types that they have. And we can also have variable types. So here I wrote, the if m is a manifold and p is a point on that manifold, then the tangent space of m at p is a real vector space. So there's a, the type of tangent vectors is uh, as, a, as a type as well. We can also have types of types. There, there are, there are uh, paradoxes there in the same way as set theory. They're resolved in the exact same way. I'm not going to talk about it. So we have a few simple type constructors. These are ways of building new types out of old types. And the two import, most important ones are pair types and function types. Pair types are types whose elements are pairs. Function types are types whose elements are functions. I think that's all I'm going to say about this. <laughs> The most important thing about this is, is that it's a homotopy type theory, and that means we have a notion of path. So there's multiple homotopy type theories that have different uh, uh, ways of implementing this idea of path or identification of mathematical objects. Um, uh, I'm going to tell you about cubical homotopy type theory because we're trying to implement this in cubical homotopy type theory. So um, we assume we have a primitive thing like a type. It's, it's, it's called the interval. The reason I don't say it's a type is because types have to have some structure that plays nice with the interval, and the interval itself does not have that. That's okay. So it's, it's like a type, and it, it's a thing, it has two elements, and we think of I as representing the concept of the unit interval. But it only has two elements, which are the endpoints. And so we can define a path to be a function to a type that evaluates those endpoints into specific points in the, in the type. So paths are interpreted as functions. And so, for example, every function now that you can write down, and you write down a function in type theory just by writing down an expression with a free variable and saying, I want the function that sends my variable to that expression, uh, preserves paths. So every function is continuous in this way, and we're in the domain of homotopy theory somehow. So, um, right, so a path is a function with, I want to note, definitional inf equality information at the endpoints here. So for types, we also have this primitive function called transport. And when we have a path between two types, we can turn that into a function that you can imagine as parallel transporting through that path. And that's a path in the type of types. So, right, so, um, right, so this is how that works. If we have a type family, so this is like a type Bx, which depends on a variable x of type A, and we have a path P between two points in A, then we get this function from BA to B, B <laughs> given by transporting along that path. And that is they're implementing our parallel transport in flat connections on bundles. As it turns out, flat connections on bundles uh, are the exact same thing as, uh, as the homotopy invariance of the lifting. So it, it, it's an interpretation here. So now I can come to our main theorem, which is a, really a, a definition and then a validation that that definition is correct. Um, and it's this big old definition up there. Um, so it looks really complicated, I think, on this one slide, but I want to tell you this is the full definition. And if you wanted to do the, uh, of the, uh, of the, the uh, twisted cohomology classes with the gaussman in connection and their parallel transport, if you wanted to do the, the analytic variant of this where you did the uh, conditioning homologic cup connection and that stuff, it's literally hundreds of hundreds of pages of background. We, we, we do it from zero in 40 pages, we even define the real numbers. It is literally from the foundations of mathematics to this definition in 40 pages, and we get a verified uh, to the ground physics, to like the, the basic physics uh, of these topological um, uh, uh, quantum computation protocols. 
So that's the main thing. I, uh, uh, I can end there, but I, I did have a few slides that are fun, but I think I'll end there. <laughs> So are there any questions in the room? I should, should set up. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Um, I find this uh, kind of just coming back to the very beginning. Uh, you've been kind of presenting this bundle approach, like kind of looking at the bundle of Hilbert spaces. And uh, I find that quite intriguing because it seems to me like you're mixing the Schrödinger and the Heisenberg picture in the same way because I mean, when we look at kind of classical <laughs> classical in quotation marks quantum mechanics then your Hilbert space is your state space right there is no need to kind of produce a bundle over that and what you're kind of arguing that uh, you know which I think is a it's an interesting model but I would kind of want to understand a little bit more about the motivation behind it because like usually when we say okay, we need to consider like outside influences and things like that, then we are tensoring the Hilbert space with like, uh, you know, like your environmental Hilbert space and uh, we're kind of looking at relative states. So what, what is the kind of, uh, yeah, like true motivation? I'm, I'm finding, finding hard to express my question, so I'm sorry about that. But what is the kind of true motivation for considering this bundle approach rather than going with the, classical approach or the orthodox approach let me call it this way thank you thanks um so uh i'm i'm, I'm not sure i can really say down to the real physical you know meat of it what it what it really is about um just because I, I just don't have the background but i can say that like um the the idea like quantum computing is a hybrid paradigm it's not like a fully quantum paradigm uh, it's uh quantum computers live within like classical measurement regimes, like every quantum algorithm involves interspersed in the quantum, a bunch of classical measurements and message passing. And for that reason, the, when you think of a quantum, from the quantum computing paradigm, you're always thinking of your quantum systems as being embedded in classical supersystems, which are represented by our parameter spaces there. And so that's like, that's one of, one of, the, one of the things there. The other thing is that like, you know, we do have these, uh, the idea is that you're driving these systems, I didn't talk about it, but you're, you're, the, these paths have to be adiabatic and you're driving them slowly. So these slow, gentle, and large scale relative to the actual system um, perturbations you're doing are easily modeled classically. So it's, I, I think pro part of the impetus is simply it's a lot easier to assume that the positions of our defects can be classically modeled on this parameter space rather than also having them be another Hilbert space that goes in. I think it simplifies things a lot. Um, uh, now, I'll say I, I really, I hope that's, uh, I hope that's uh, good. I don't have uh, my retainers here to tell me if I'm, you know, speaking nonsense. So, um, yeah. Great. So I think that's all the time we have for, for questions for the moment. So let's... Uh...